Welcome back to TEC Tube. I'm Ryan Holger, and this is the first in a multi-part series on gas-fired furnaces, talking about natural gas and propane furnaces. Uh, the first video series will be for component identification, then we'll do sequence of operation, and then advanced troubleshooting features. So let's head into the lab and get started. All right, so we're looking at an 80% furnace here. So let's get this guy opened up. So a lot of the 80% furnaces, at least the carrier ones, we have a separate panel that has to come off in order to get access to the blower and the control section on this guy. Alright, now we have full access to everything in the furnace here. So let's take a closer look. So looking at some of the components in the furnace, we'll kind of work our way from the top down to kind of cover the components. And then like we said in future video series, we'll explain how all these components you know, physically function. So on a 80% non-condensing furnace, we have sheet metal base venting. All right, on 90% we'll have PVC venting, so that's a quick way to check there. Some of the components that you'll notice on here, we have this limit switch here on the, on the uh, venting for an 80% furnace. This is sort of unique to Bryant and Carrier furnaces. This particular switch here is a blocked vent switch and it detects heat specifically. So if we were to get to a fairly high temperature in the flue because there was a blockage, a bird's nest or something like that in the flue, in the vent pipe, then this switch would detect that extra heat because we're not moving the air and that switch would trip and shut the system down so we don't continue to burn gas in someone's home without having a proper venting mechanism. So uh, draft guard or block vent switch are common names you'll hear for this particular switch. We have pressure switches here in, in the furnace as well. That's a Another mechanism that we use to make sure we have airflow moving through the venting system. Um, you'll find these in all manufacturer's furnaces and you'll find them in both condensing and non-condensing. So 80% so and 90% furnaces both will have these pressure switches in there. So when the inducer fan is running, air is moving through this vent pipe and these pressure switches prove that we have air moving through there and electronically send a signal back to the circuit board to let us know that it is safe to fire this system. So these are your pressure switches that you'll have on there. Um, other common components, this is our inducer fan assembly, right? So this guy's job is to actually move air through the vent pipe. So he sucks air into the system. Right? And on an 80% furnace, on a non condensing furnace, we'll have holes in the grate to physically pull the air in from your home and run that into that fan. So air comes in the grate, runs through the fan, and then goes through the heat exchanger assembly and then exhausts out the flue pipe. So that's what that inducer fan's job in life is. Um, below that here, you'll notice we have our gas valve, right? So this gas valve's job is obviously to open and close to allow gas to flow through the system. This is a simple furnace with a single stage gas valve. Some of the other ones we'll look at today will have either two stage gas valves or fully modulating gas valves. But this one's a pretty basic one. This is just a, uh, actually this is a two stage one, I'm sorry. This is a two-stage gas valve. We have single stage, two stage, and modulating gas. If you look back here, we have our limit switch, right? And we'll give you a zoomed in view of that here. So that's our limit switch. Down over here, we have two other components, three other components in the actual burner section itself. So we have our flame rectification probe, and we'll take a closer look at that. We have our igniter back here, right? And that's what's gonna actually burn the gas or ignite the gas initially. We can take a closer look at that. And then we have our flame rollout switches. We have one right here. And on some furnaces, we'll show you later, we have two like this one. There's another one back over here. And now we can take a closer look at that. So here's our burner section right here. Uh, in this case, we have one, two, three, four burners. This is a 90,000 BTU input furnace. The higher the BTU input, the more burners we have, the lower the input, the less burners we'll have. But this is a four burner uh, setup here. We have several components that are attached onto the burner assembly specifically. One of these here is the igniter switch, or the igniter itself. Uh, you can have a spark ignition, or more commonly now we have a hot surface ignition. That's the most common scenario. So that guy will heat up, and then as we flow gas across it, that'll spark off the ignition. Um, so that's his job in life. Um, back over here on this side, you'll see we have a flame rectification probe. His job is to prove we actually have a fire. Because what we don't want to do is have the igniter turn on, flow gas, 
not get anything burning, and then continue to flow gas into someone's house. We definitely don't want that. So that flame, rect flame rectification probe's job is to detect that we actually have a flame in there, which means that things are burning correctly. We have a couple other things on here too. You'll see one on the right side, and there's one over here on the left side. Sometimes you'll also see them on top or on bottom of the, of the burner area. They are back on the front side of the burner where there would not be any combustion happening. Those are called rollout switches. So if there was a problem where the heat exchanger was plugged up or something like that and the flames could not shoot into the heat exchanger, they would be burning and come back out. Those guys will detect the high temperature of that and then shut the system down. So if flames are coming back out instead of going into the burner, those rollout switches, their job is to detect that rolling out flame and they'll shut that system down. So down here in the blower section, we have several components that we can look at. One of these is the door interlock switch that we have over here, right? So that guy's job, if we take the door off of the, of the furnace itself, it'll disconnect power to the furnace. That way if somebody's in there that shouldn't be in there, or if they forgot to shut the disconnect off, it's a safety mechanism to protect them. We have a transformer up here on top of the, of the furnace, or top of the blower assembly. So the transformer's job is to take the 120 volt power coming in from the utility and to step that power down to just 24 volts. We use 24 volts to control everything in the furnace on the circuit board and all the sensors that we talked about previously uh, and our thermostat as well. On the circuit board itself here in the middle, that's the, the main brain of the system. All the logic is happening there. All the decisions are happening there. Down on the left-hand side here, we have terminal strips. They're labeled for the thermostat inputs. So the thermostat will send a separate wire signal to ask for fan, heating, cooling, second stage heating, second stage cooling, dehumidification, whatever the case may be. So that's where the thermostat's going to wire at on here. There is a fuse on most of these circuit boards. Uh, this is a three amp automotive style fuse. That is there to protect the circuit board. If there was a power issue, we don't want to lose a fairly expensive circuit board. We'd much rather lose a dollar fuse or even less than a dollar. The rest of the wiring on here is wiring to the safety switches we talked about previously, or it's wiring over to the motors to turn them on and off. So the, 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 the circuit board itself is making all of the decisions when to turn things on and off. Down here we have a capacitor. You'll find capacitors on most inductive loads, so most motors and compressors will have a capacitor on there. That's because when an inductive load turns on, it draws a lot of power from the utility. So instead of having that massive amp draw, we have a capacitor on there to kind of give us a buffering power capacity. It's like a giant battery, like a storage system for electricity. So you'll find these capacitors on the PSC, permanent split capacitor uh, motors. You will not find them on the ECM variable speed type motors. Then this whole circuit board and capacitor and transformer and everything are screwed on to the housing of the actual blower of the fan itself. And there's a motor on here and then there's the actual fan assembly in there that we'll talk about in a little bit. So this is a condensing furnace, and this one's 90%, actually this one's actually 97% efficient. We just looked at a non-condensing 80%er, so there's gonna be some differences here. We're gonna point those out so you can know what those pieces look like that are a little bit different. So this particular one opens a little different as well. It's a two-piece design, the top and the bottom door, and this one is a toolless entry style. So we don't need a nut driver to get into some of these other components here. Uh, we have our up top we have all of our burner assembly type stuff and 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 exhaust systems and at the bottom we have our blower assembly and our controls so let's take a little bit of a deeper dive so let's first talk about our exhaust system on here on the condensing 90 percent plus furnaces a lot of stuff is similar to the 80s that we talked about previously we are still going to have an inducer motor to draw the gases through the heat exchanger and exhaust them out Sometimes on these guys, they are variable speed. Sometimes they are two stage. Sometimes they are just one stage. So kind of similar to before. Our exhaust in this case is gonna go out on a PVC pipe. That's because there is a condensate. There's a, a, a moisture nature to the exhaust system. So we can't vent it in sheet metal like we do on the 80 percenters. So on the 90 percenters, we gotta vent it in PVC piping. So we'll have that part of the system here. We still have our pressure sensors on here like we had on the other ones. We do not have a draft block sensor on here like we do on the 80s. That's something unique to that kind of product. Uh, but these ones do have the pressure sensors to prove that we do have airflow moving through the system. Another thing that's going to be different on the 90 percenters, we have this condensate trap down here. As moisture is condensing in the secondary heat exchanger, which we'll look at in a little bit, that moisture gets, comes down through that trap and anything, any debris or anything in the air that was in the, in the moisture will get caught there and we'll be able to take a look at that. 
and that condensate trap will then allow the condensate to flow all the way out the system. It actually runs through a pipe like this and goes out the side of the furnace. Sometimes we call it a Z pipe because of its, its shape. So let's move on to the combustion side of the furnace. Uh, it's kind of flip-flop from the 80 percenter we looked at. Up over there we had the exhaust system and the combustion side. These two are opposite of each other in this case. So the combustion stuff's on top here. Here's our burner assembly like we looked at previously. We have all the same kind of components we had before. We have a gas valve, although in this case it's a modulating gas valve. This one goes from 40 to 100 percent in 1 percent increments. So it's kind of like a 61 stage furnace, but it's a gas valve nonetheless. We have our igniter on here that initiates our spark. We have our flame rectification probe that we talked about earlier. And then we have some of the rollout switch protection, one on that side and one down over here on the bottom that we talked about previously. And then back behind the gas valve, we have a limit switch just like the one we looked at previously. So for the blower side of the furnace, some of the things are very similar like we talked about. We have another kind of door interlock switch. So we don't have power when someone takes the door off. Here's our transformer like we had in the previous unit that we looked at. Here's our main circuit board. There are a few things that are different on this circuit board because this one happens to be a high-end variable speed condensing furnace. Uh, for example, you'll notice we're not using the thermostat inputs here. Instead, we have this communicating block. This block sends communication signals over to a wall control as opposed to actual traditional thermostat signals. That way we can move a lot more information and data. We still got our three amp fuse. We still have a wiring to all of our sensors. We still have our wiring over to our motor assembly. There is a model plug on these up on top here above the uh, dip switches. When you change out one of these circuit boards, you need to save the model plug from the old circuit board because that has information about what this unit identity is and put that old model plug onto the new replacement circuit board. Um, and then we'll talk about the motor over here and the motor assembly itself. So we slid the blower assembly out. We're actually still wired up to the, the actual furnace right now. It's pretty easy to get these guys out. It was just two screws to slide out. So our circuit board's on the front here still. On the side over here, you can see our motor. So the motor is physically back here. And this is the control assembly for the ECM motor here, sometimes called the bell. Um, sometimes you can get these pieces separately, just the control mechanism. Um, or sometimes you'll buy the control mechanism and the motor together. All of our electrical wiring goes over back to the circuit board area. Um, this fan housing here sometimes comes in multiple parts. We have the end plates, one on that side, one on that side. If you flip it over here a little bit, you can see the actual wheel of the fan itself. Right, so the motor is turning that wheel, which is generating the pressure to generate, to move air down the duct system. If we flip it over one more time, you can see the whole inside of the actual blower assembly of the wheel here. All right, so the shaft from the motor is coming through and it's physically able to turn this right, at a fairly high RPM, much higher than I'm going to turn with my hand, obviously. The other piece that's different on a condensing 90% furnace is that we have a secondary heat exchanger. So an 80% non-condensing furnace has one heat exchanger, the primary. The 90% have two, a primary and a secondary. The idea is to have more surface area to be able to do more heat transfer. But because of that, there is a acidic condensate nature to that. So we have to have it made out of a, a non-ferrous metal like stainless steel or aluminum or something like that. So this is the secondary out of the furnace that we were just working on. Actually, it's the same type of secondary we have in that furnace. This one's a little beat up because we use it in the lab a lot here. Um, you'll notice that there's tube style going through it and there's fins on all of the tubes in order to get the surface area for the heat transfer. And then if you look inside the heat exchanger itself, you'll notice we have these little turbulators down in the heat exchanger. So their job is to cause the gas to swirl to make it more turbulent and make it touch the outside of the tubes more so that way we get more heat transfer as the exhaust, the warm exhaust goes through here. Um, and then obviously the air from your home is going across this side of the heat exchanger. So the air and the exhaust never actually touch each other. This is something else that's a little bit different on a condensing furnace. Well, thanks for joining us today. Hopefully that gives you a better idea of some of the components that you'll find in both 80 and 90% condensing and non-condensing furnaces. And we'll see you at the next video. Thanks.